Hello and welcome to the panel, where we take a look at graphic novels and talk about their story, art, and everything in between. On this episode, in honor of National Women's Month, we will be discussing a graphic novel whose cast of characters is predominantly women, just like the book's creative team. So cozy up with your inner, inner demon and sip on some Ilium, because we're about to delve into Monstrous from Image Comics. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the panel. Uh, do not adjust your set. I'm not <laughs> Amy. Uh, Amy is unfortunately out sick, so I'm Johnny Rose. I produce the Previews World Weekly show with Ashton and Troy, and I'm taking over as hosting the du as hosting duties because I am one of the few people that actually had to read this because I had to put the graphics together for this. But my other panelists are here, and thank you. I'm gonna I'm gonna thank you for them. Uh, Joining me, uh, starting off with the, um, uh, let's see here, everyone's favorite fangirl, Natasha, a.k.a. Kendall X from DST Unboxed. Hi! <laughs> our new collectibles videos from internet, from the internet, TikTok, Instagram, all the things. All the things. <laughs> and, of course, also joining me is the one and only, the Duchess of Free Comic Book Day herself, Ashton Greenwood. Hey, what's up, guys? I'm excited to be here. Got a hey, lot of thoughts. Hey, howdy, hey. Hey, howdy, hey. <laughs> <laughs> so as I said, we're going to be uh, getting into Monstrous. So real quick, we're going to do a quick summary of, of the uh, the plot. So Monstrous is set in a matriarchal world inspired by early 20th century Asia. The background of the story is that a war between the Arcanics, which are magical creatures who sometimes can pass for humans, and the human federation led by the Khmea, who is an order of sorceresses who consume who consume the Arcanics to fuel the Kamea's power. And with a richly imagined world of Art Deco and inflected steampunk, Monstrous tells the story of Micah Halfwolf, a teenage girl who is struggling to survive the trauma of war and who shares a mysterious psychic link with a monster of tremendous power. It's a connection that will transform them both and make them the target of both human and otherworldly powers. Monstrous was first published by Image Comics in November of 2015. The series has won multiple Hugo Awards, British Fantasy Awards, the Harvey Award, and five Eisner Awards, making writer Marjorie Liu the first ever woman to win an Eisner in the Best Writer category. That is a mouthful. So, yeah. initial thoughts, diving into it. When you picked up the book, what was your uh, first thought uh, going into reading this? Let's we'll start with uh, Ashton. Okay, great. I was going to volunteer myself anyway. <laughs> um, I It was one of those things that sucked me in right away because you open it to the first page of the first issue and it drops you right into the story as things are in that world. There's no preamble or explanation or really no context, which I appreciated because it sucked me in right away. Because without that context, you're immediately like, okay, who are these people? Like, who are the Arcanics? What, what is the beef about? Like, why are we fighting? What is the value of these things? So I love that. Um, the art, I'm, I mean, I'm sure we'll be broken records by the end of this. The art's incredible, <laughs> like insane. I'm sure all three of us will say it a number of times. It is beautiful. It is breathtaking. Uh, and some of the creatures, some of like the monstra are insane. Like how do people come up with these things? Just larger than life, unbelievable. And like Johnny pointed out, I love that it's a in a world that is like completely female run. Like all of the main like the the shaman empress, the the um, death, the mother superior, all women, all of like your heavy hitters and your biggest players are women, and I'm about that, especially during Women's History Month. Yeah. Natasha, what about you? Yep, Natasha. Same same thing. Um, when I first picked up the book, I mean, I had no no idea what this was about. I had zero like other than the cover, which looks mm -hmm. amazing, like super detailed, kind of like felt like kind of steampunky to me. I had no idea what was going to happen or what was about. And even the first few pages, the art stuff you in and the, like the mystery of the story and who's this mm -hmm. person and what's happened to her. Why is this the way it is? And all of that just kind of sucks you in right away. So absolutely. And that's one of the tricky things with um, with any medium, really. But I mean, I find this a lot when I'm reading comics or even regular novels that 
it's really you, the writer has a really tough part or tough job to try and orient the reader. You know, you're you're coming into yeah. like a uh -huh. new title, like you know, brand new, and you just have to figure out like, you know, how can I get oriented into the story? But um, mm -hmm. speaking of the story, we're gonna del delve into that now and talk a little bit about the story. So as I mentioned earlier, Marjorie Liu was the, or is the writer of Monstrous. She is a New York Times best-selling and award-winning writer, best known for her fiction and comic book work. Miss Liu's extensive work includes the best-selling Astonishing X-Men for Marvel Comics, which featured the gay wedding of X-Men North Star, and was subsequently nominated for a GLAAD Media Award for Outstanding Media Images of the Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender Community. Miss Lou is also a lawyer and has taught comic book writing at MIT. So Ooh. very impressive accolades there. Yeah. Um, I'm going to start us off on this. Um, and I'm, I think I might gonna, I'm kind of setting the tone for all of us here. Mm -hmm. I found this a little difficult to start to get into at first. And let me just explain that because the one thing, well, not one of the one thing, but the, one of the things that I would say monstrous has going for it is that, it is very expansive. Like Miss Lou, like does an incredible job at world building, like right from the start. Like I can almost equate her world world building on like a Tolkien or George R. R. Martin esque level oh. because there is so much going on here. Like there's so many factors going on. There's so many factions that are in play here. We have like the Arcanists. Yeah. We have the Kamea. We have just like the war that's been going on, which is like, you know, still raging to this day, I think, or just, you know, they're recuperating from some of the big battles. Like they keep mentioning like a war at Constantine, which we see glimpses uh -huh. of later on in the book. Mm -hmm. So simply because of the fact that I could instantly tell that this is such a huge and expansive world, it felt a little bit difficult for me to get into. That mm -hmm. being said, the more that I read it, the more I, I started to understand like what each of the characters, you know, motivations were, where they were coming from. But starting off, it was a little difficult. Did you find that to be the case, um, Ashton? I actually had the reverse experience, sure. interestingly enough. So like I said, when I first started reading it, I was super into it right away because I kind of liked the idea of being in this like high fantasy steampunk world with very little context other than just like having these warring factions. But I've, kind of felt like the longer it went on and the more like details that were provided, it kind of bogged itself down in details. Uh, and for me, it made it a little harder to follow where we were headed. Okay, understandable. Uh, Natasha, how about you? What did you think of the story? Okay, so for me, straight out the gate, it was like the first few scenes are very disturbing. And the fact that like yeah. we've got like these magical kids in chains and there's clearly a slave selling thing happening and like you're just like what's going on but at the same time like some of the images are also really pretty like the costumes um or not costumes i guess they're just clothing in this it's not <laughs> uh, <laughs> um the imagery is really cool um and then you do i, I kind of like immediately dove into it like i wanted to know why is this girl locked up why you know why is it so interesting about the fact that she's missing part of her arm or, yeah. you know, all these people are controlling and what is this faction that is totally taking these kids and experimenting on them? Why? Like, why, you know, why, why, why? And I wanted to know more. And then in came this quirky cat, which was the best <laughs> part for me. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, it, and the story went on and, and as it progressed, I got more information and I liked how you're in the present, but then it would shoot you back. Like, a month ago and then like two weeks ago mm -hmm. you kind of you're kind of getting a little more of the story in little bits and pieces but then about halfway through the book that's when it started getting difficult for me mm -hmm. to like follow along still like um there was like Ashley was saying there was just so much detail and so much information that you did kind of get bogged down by it a little bit and get kind of like you know what huh, what you know but you still yeah. keep going with the story but you definitely um yeah, it did kind of draw out a little bit for me. I will say one thing though, I did like how the um, there were moments where you do go back and you see the flashbacks mm -hmm. of like yeah. what happened and how to Micah Half Wolf 
got to where she is. Mm-hmm. At the same time, I felt like, and that just may this may be just me like kind of over reading into it, but kind of seeing her glimpses into the past, like kind of mirrored what the monster was kind of f- feeling later on when it kind of emerged from the stump in her arm, because Ooh. it's kind of like, where am I? What's going on? How can mm-hmm. I recognize your face? So there's a little bit yeah. of like reflection between the two of like, you know, learning the history of what's going on with her and then also figuring out how the demon ties into it as well. Mm-hmm. Um, what would you say uh, was these? I know we were all saying that they were kind of parts that kind of were kind of uh, like hit or miss for us. Mm-hmm. But what would you say was some of the, uh, the were one of the strongest aspects of the story for you, Natasha? The cat. The cat. <laughs> <laughs> the cat. No, I think one of the strong aspects for me is kind of when she's talking to herself, like all this other dialogues mm-hmm. going on and all this other noise and stuff, and she's just kind of like in her own head and trying to I feel like with all the trauma and horror that she's seen and gone through she's trying to compartmentalize a little bit and trying to like put those puzzle pieces together Mm -hmm. she's trying to figure out like at one point when she gets the picture with her mother in it she's trying to figure out who these other people are what are they connected to what you know and so for me like uh, I really like mystery stuff so like that I feel like she was trying to solve her own mystery and her own thing while all this other chaos is still going on and to me that's kind of relatable like you've got that internal monologue going on mm-hmm. we're still also trying to convey and interact with other people and, and she's trying to break away and then like what you said actually now pointing that out johnny about how um uh about the fact that like the monster or the demon is kind of like a reflection of her and then later on in the story the demon's kind of doing the same thing of having that reflection of trying to puzzle piece together mm-hmm. stuff. So that part I thought was really cool. That I, that that really I connected with that part. I think mm-hmm. mainly. Uh, how about you, Ashton? What would you say for you was one of the uh, strongest aspects of the story? So this might be kind of an odd answer, but I thought one of the most interesting things about this, hands down, is how brutal all of the women are at, in their characters. You know, Mother Superior and Micah and Lady Sophia mm-hmm. and Yvette and just completely unapologetic and brutal in all of their own quests, whatever that means. I think it's fantastic. And I think it's a really great representation because a lot of times in media, women tend to be portrayed as soft or um, in their quests or on the other side of that, they're like hysterical and over the top. And I thought this did a really good job of showing women as like single minded and badass and tough and, and checking all of the boxes that any male heroine would. Mm. I think that you bring up a really good point because uh, like I said earlier, that the creative team of this book is predominantly women. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, you know, I'm sure that a lot of the ways that women have been portrayed in comics is from a male perspective. So Mm -hmm. I feel like when, when a male is writing a female character, you know, you're still giving that male perspective on how a male thinks a female would act. Mm -hmm. So, do either of you feel like this kind of accurately represents the different ways or different dynamics that women kind of interact with each other as represented in this scenario? Natasha, I'll go with you. I want to say yes. Mm-hmm. Like there was, there's one scene where you have these, um, these group of women who are like out there, they're kind of like the, uh, almost like the, like the hunter assassins or something like that. Are you that talking there. about the Inquisitors? Yes. yes. Yeah. Mother Superior's personal guard or whatever there. Yeah, the Inquisitors, right? In- the Inquisitrixes. Sure. Um, I think the Inquisitors is Star Wars. Right, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, shot a lot of Star Wars stuff today. Um, but I loved their interaction and the fact that mm-hmm. they were 100% brutal, got the job done, did what they had to do, whatever. But then... And one of the, you know, and you think the your first initial thought when you see them in this scenario and these, um, like happenstances of oh we've got to we're taking this head off and shooting this guy and doing this and whatever, like you kind of feel like there's no empathy, there's no feelings. But then one of their own gets hurt, and instead of I honestly thought they're going to be like oh just leave her or something like that, they split up their group of oh, you take yeah. her back and get her taken care of why we go and finish this job. Like, I love that. That 100%, mm-hmm. that's 
that's real life to me. Like, that's accurate. Like, we've got a job to do. Here it is. It's brutal. It's nasty. We look nasty. It looks, you know, because we got to portray this way. But one of our own is hurt. Okay, let's care for her and then still go and get this job done. So, yeah. Ashton, what about you? How did you feel about the different interactions between different female characters in the in the book? I also think it was pretty true to form, uh, especially the thing. The main thing that jumped out to me was um, how detail oriented they were, though, in terms of the way they talk to each other. You know, uh -huh. women tend to focus on on those details and getting down to the nitty gritty of things and being very precise in their language. Uh, and so specifically like when Mother Superior reanimates uh, Lady Yvette and is trying to like uh -huh. get information out of her, just like really like kind of petty almost and not to like paint women in a negative light, but just really like specific and, you know, down to the, the finite details that you need. Uh, so I appreciated that. The other thing that I thought they did really well, specifically with Michael, was representing the duality of emotions that you can have. Mm -hmm. um, and so for her, like when it came time to fight and to, you know, break the arcanics out of jail, she was very, very focused. And that was her thing. And she didn't shed a tear. She was serious about what she was doing. But then in flashbacks, when you see her interacting with Tua, um, and she's very emotional and, you know, she cries and you see her kind of trying to work through a lot of that trauma. So kind of, you know, being good at compartmentalizing when you can process certain things also feels very, very realistic. And you bring up a good point. I'm like, you want to carry that conversation over into my next question. So mm -hmm. would, do you think that Micah Half-Wolf is a relatable character? And if not, who do you relate to most in the story? Ashton, mm -hmm. let's continue with your train of thought. Yeah, I definitely think Micah for that exact reason. Um, although I, I found Tua also kind of interesting, even though she was like a, a secondary character, mm -hmm. um, because she she very much feels like the protective sibling. Uh, but I think Micah is probably the most for the reason of like you have things you want to accomplish, things that are important to you, to your personal value, your your personal narrative. But you also have people you want to protect, and you're trying to you know process your own trauma as you go through and trying to just I don't I, I want to say stay you know not lose your humanity stay humane although she's not human but I mean <laughs> the concept still applies <laughs> I mean she does appear human it's like you, you know reading mm -hmm. the story you do kind of like I mean I often found myself forgetting that she was an arcanic because yeah. mm -hmm. there were no like visible traits like little wolf or a little fox mm -hmm. had like the ears yeah. and the tail and other Arcanics had like you know the Cyclops kid that mm -hmm. had like one eye. So you do find yourself forgetting that she is an arcanic. But yeah, mm -hmm. Natasha, how about you? Do you feel like Micah was a relatable character? And if not, like who did you relate to in the story? Yeah, I mean, for sure. For sure. I, I pretty much Ashton nailed it on the head. Um that just that compartmentalizing everything that she's gotta go through and she's trying to find answers about, and yeah, she still has people that she cares about or people that she's trying to help also survive, but also play it off. Like she doesn't care mm -hmm. at the same time, her actions show that she clearly does. And, you know, just trying to, she doesn't want to hear any of the nonsense from the cat either <laughs> or, or the demon for that matter. Yeah. And she's just like, you know, I just need answers. Like she just wants to heal. She just wants answers. And, uh, you know, but at the same time, she still has to go through all these trials mm -hmm. to get there. And so she tries to stay as focused as possible. And a lot of that is kind of shutting down some of the other emotions so she can get those, um, get through those trials. So I will say one thing that I go, went back and reread the story again, and there were elements upon second reading that I didn't pick up that actually helped me have a little bit of a better understanding because mm -hmm. at first reading, I'm kind of like, well, why is she, what is the backstory and like why she's breaking into this compound to mm -hmm. find, you know, Miss Yvette. And then I realized mm -hmm. like an element that I had missed later on, like there was um, this full picture that she found yeah. in the compound, mm -hmm. I believe. But there was another part earlier on, I think, or maybe later on, I forget which, where she had only half of the photo that was yeah. her mother and Miss Yvette. So then go back and going back and reading this and it's like, oh, there's two other people in the picture. So mm -hmm. it just added a little bit more depth to the story and like, trying to fuel her motivation in terms of like finding out the truth or like what mm -hmm. happened to her mother, like all those years ago. Mm -hmm. 
But I think that's uh, that wraps up for the story. I really want to get into right now is talking about the art because we've all like our yes. <laughs> about the art a little bit already. So let's talk a little bit more about the art. So the artist of Monstrous is Sana Takeda, and she is an illustrator and comic book artist who was born in Niigata, Japan. At age 20, she started out as a designer for Sega and then became a freelance artist when she was 25. She has worked on such titles as X-Men, Venom, Civil War, and Miss Marvel, as well as X-23 in 2010, where she worked with Marjorie Liu. So starting off, I, I think I know the answers for this, but did <laughs> Natasha, did you like the art? <laughs> yes. Yes, I like the art. <laughs> I thought it was really cool. It's a little um, like the steampunk style. I really like um, the... I liked that the images had a dark undertone to them, but it wasn't like, you know, like I can't see it kind of thing. Like there was still so much detail and each image has like so many layers to it. Um, I mean, yeah, like that, like you've got, it's just not just, oh, there's the demon wrapping up. Like there's all this extra art in there. There's extra lines. There's just mm -hmm. extra, Like you can almost feel the motion of those tentacles coming out. Yes. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like it really, it, hel it helped really um, flow the story along mm -hmm. with some of the parts that might have been harder to understand. You could kind of get it through the photos, too, mm -hmm. or images. <laughs> Ashton, how about you? Uh, what do you have to say about the art? Yeah, I love the art. I particularly liked all of the way the people were drawn, especially uh, when they would do, like, the close-up of the faces. Uh -huh. uh, and whenever anyone would, like, you know, die, when the guard dies in the beginning or when Lady Yvette dies, uh, and they just like zoom in on the face and th so many details, all of the lines and wrinkles of like what a face would look like as the life drains from it is incredible. Yeah. It's That's so, amazing. So amazing. Yeah. I love watching murder happen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the other thing that I thought was really interesting is, and I would love to find it, like, yeah, this this excels on a on a big scale, like you mentioned, Natasha. But like the, God, I definitely want to find it. When Lady Yvette <clears throat> first realizes that she's talking to Micah, and she knows, like, she realizes who it is, and she puts it together. Uh -huh. It's three panels that like slowly show the realization dawning on her face. Yep. Oh, I found it. Johnny, yeah. can I show this? I hope it doesn't look atrocious. These three panels yeah, of like you can oh, see yeah. the realization coming on, on into her mm -hmm. eyes there. Yeah. Yeah. Just like really, really small details that pull it together and just take it next level. And the thing, like, you know, you bring out a really good point there is there's very little like uh, text there, very little copy to read. Yeah. Like there are elements of the book that full pages are, have no words at all that are just beautiful to look at. You can mm. look at this from like page 32 or so, I think it was, and just, you know, easily follow the action of like what's happening as she's trying to escape the compound. Yeah. Yeah. And things like this, like just the, the, the low angles and how everything, you know, just, mm -hmm. it feels like, you know, almost watching it. Like, like mm -hmm. it's a movie, like I can tell like the camera, like, well, I say camera, but like I, I'm a videographer, so that's how I would like I would <laughs> depict it. Yeah. But I can just see that being like a live action shot, and I can see like the camera placement and how like it just oh, I loved it. Part of the other thing I love, and I've said this many times before on like other of our streams, I love the way that artists will play with the panels themselves. I love how yes. like you know regular panels will be you know, just straight white and then yeah. like that. But when like the action starts to kick in and like murder starts to happen, like Ashton loves yeah. to watch, just how like <laughs> things will like yeah. break through the panels and what yeah. happens. Yeah, yeah I, I love that. And there's another part later on, let me see if I can find the image. Uh, I think it was in issue six or like one of the later issues of the, uh, the trade paperback. When she goes in, here it is. When she goes into oh. a flashback mm -hmm. and the lines are actually fuzzy because yeah. you know, memories fade after time. Memories aren't always exactly what we think right. what they think they are. So that was a great effect. I love how when Mother Superior starts to like transform, how her hand is breaking uh -huh. through the panels here. I knew she was a baddie. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, we kind of knew that from the beginning. I mean, we knew, yeah, we but knew. like, I, I had a feeling like there was something more to her. Like, mm -hmm. why is she such a baddie? Like, mm -hmm. such a baddie. <laughs> such a baddie. And then it uh, I'm going to oh, so ask kind of a demon. So, uh, did you think like the art supported the uh, story, Natasha? Yes, absolutely. And, and then some, mm -hmm. like this, I mean, like, you know, we, we keep going back and forth and talking about like, it's a movie, but really this was like reading a movie. Like the, the way it was done, it was like a very intense, dark anime. It was very cool. Very cool. And it's, yeah. Like all those characters, those guys are amazing. Love all that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just, I just remember we do have people in the comments that have been comments too. So oh yeah, to, oh. I need to check in with that. <laughs> We're halfway through the show. I'm forgotten. Sorry, Annie's everybody. Dead. Annie Fox is checking in. I'm on the freeway. Reception might be spotty. Annie, don't be watching this while you're driving. Yeah, don't you do that. be careful. <laughs> um. Oh, Matt's commenting in. Hand pink waving, face blue smiling. I'm guessing that's emojis that didn't. Come up, maybe. Yeah. That could be. <laughs> Hi, Matt. Uh, Annie Zane also awesome art. She Very. also asking mm -hmm. how many issues are in the run. I believe it's still, still ongoing. Going, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, here we go. Yep. Brexco was chiming in saying that the series is still going on. I think right now they're in like issue 42, 44, somewhere around there. I think. Um, I think this is Troy checking in. Natasha's yes. clearly in our studio with that 4K camera. <laughs> No, she's just. I don't stealing. wait. Are you complimenting me or mocking me? No, she's just stealing our backgrounds. Yeah, literally <laughs> she is. And then, I love this when we we always invariably get one of these. I'd Yay. like to offer promotion of your channel, viewers and followers that chat. Blah 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 blah. Mm -hmm. blah. No, thank you. I've been trying to reach you about your car warranty. Oh, and he says she's not driving but busy navigating. Okay, okay. that's good. Okay. An important co-pilot is yes. is critical to. But navigating not that not that well if she's watching us and not the road. So, but yeah, thank you for watching. <laughs> um, uh, Ashton, did I ask you if the art supported the story? I'm I got sidetracked there. Um, you did not, but yeah, oh, I, yeah, I will answer that now. And I think that it did. <laughs> and I think, like Natasha said, in some cases, it held up the story in areas where maybe the dialogue and writing got a little too confusing. You could fall back on it, and it did a really mm -hmm. good job buttressing the story because it's that strong. Um, and I think describing it as a, a dark anime is perfect. I think that hits the nail right on the head because it is incredibly dynamic and sharp in the same mm -hmm. way like anime or manga is, but it does yeah. still have like that fantasy steampunk vibe. It does a mm -hmm. good job of meeting in the middle. Um, since I'm talking, I just want to make sure I point this out because I thought it was incredible when Micah and the little fox like run into the monster for the first time and it's just like that giant mountain with all the eyeballs in it but it also has a spine and a rib cage i was yeah. like oh, like that took my breath away just is this the one yeah yes like tell me that's not incredible you can just keep looking at it and find more details the longer mm -hmm. you look at it, there's blood coming out of the main eye it's beautiful let me ask yeah. you this now. I'm I, no. I have to admit, I was a little confused as to what this was. So, what was your take on this? So they uh, originally yeah. said that it was like the humans and the Kumea said that it was a ghost, but that the Arcanics had found a way to like manifest it in a physical form. But then, like Micah said, sometimes they pray to it, and it's part of like a religious experience. So, I I can't say with any certainty that I ever nailed down exactly what it is it seems like mm -hmm. maybe it's just some mythical you know being beyond a firm explanation it seemed to me my understanding anyway and this is entirely subjective was that it was like some sort of creature that was part of like the arcanics religion that, i think that makes sense that's probably a good take of it and let me see if i can find the image again here real quick I definitely noticed they mentioned a few times when like the little fox is scared and like can it see us or this and they mm -hmm. just keep saying the dead can't see. Right. All these yeah. things have like way too many eyes. I will say that. <laughs> <laughs> There's just eyes everywhere. Like the demon has eyes over it. This mountain has mm -hmm. eyes all over mm -hmm. it. Just, I mean, it's all very unsettling, but in, in, <laughs> in, a, in a sense, it just makes you want. Like again, it makes you want to read more and kind of find out like. Where where is this going? Like, what is like the history behind this? Like, everything has a story, or you know, mm -hmm. you know they wouldn't put these things in there for no absolutely no reason at all. It's obviously, yeah, 
which I'm sure probably they might get into a little bit more in like some of the later episode or yeah. later issues, which we haven't read yet. So sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, sorry, team. Continuing with the artwork uh, talk, uh, Natasha, do you, would you say there's any particular moment where the art really stood out for you? Um, let me see. Actually, yes, there is. So that's really cool. Let me find it. This, the beginning of chapter four. Oh my God. That was oh. like, that's one of the uh, cover images. Yep. Yeah. That is that's just beautiful. So cool. Like, look at all that back there. I mean, all just all the details, like Ashton was saying, like, you just keep looking and you keep seeing more and more and more. Her that composition, definitely. Her composition on some of these I covers. Like unicorn. Oh, yeah. Her <laughs> composition on some of these covers actually reminds me a little bit of H.R. Geiger, the artist who did yes, the original yes, art uh -huh. that Aliens was based yep. on. So I can I definitely see, like, like some of that influence in there. I mean, maybe not, yeah. you know, directly or intentionally, but definitely it, it shows up in there. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love the Art Deco style of it. I, um, huh. I I just, it's a very, very interesting style to go with. And I also have to give it up to Santa Takeda's uh, coloring because mm -hmm. part of that would be, you know, what actually brings this to life. And not everything is like yeah. super bright and vibrant. Like you might yeah. see in a superhero story. There is some like, like, and I think one of you said this earlier, there's a bit of a darkness and a grittiness to it that mm -hmm. would come with, you know, a society and a culture that has been like ravaged by war, you know, whatever happened back at, you know, Constantine, you know, it, it right. drove people a little bit crazy. I mean, here we have Micah, like having to eat open, you know, parts Boy, of a stomach. little boy just for survival. Oh. And she said when they were slaves, you know, they had to do what they could to survive. And the colors are all very muted, very, nothing's like super bright, but there are times, let me see if I can actually find this. This I one. Mean, this is really cool too, of that like hint of color. Oh yeah, yep. Yeah. And yeah. When, when he shows that's up from really the dust court, yeah. I think that's the uh, that's, that's one really of the cool. first real big pops yeah. of color I think we see. Uh -huh. At least in a while, other than when the kids are getting electrocuted. Oh right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know, well, that I mean, that's a yeah. The like when she's burning, Lady Sophia. Yeah. I mean, look the, that just that whole two pages. There's just so. And that also helps with like the telling of the story too. Like yeah. you can tell there's a definite like color shift when mm. she goes into like her mind, when she goes into yeah. her memory or there's, yeah. a completely yeah. different, there's a completely different color palette when it's a, a flashback, you know, trying to mm -hmm. relive like what happened with her and Tua. Mm -hmm. so, right. Um, yeah. So it's, I think the color is definitely one of the stars also of this book, not just the art, but the coloring of each yeah. of the panels. So. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, yeah, like here with two, you can see there's definitely yeah. muted colors in there. It's like, it looks like something almost has like a sepia tone on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, think really, really well done in the art. I mean, I, I could go on and on about that. But <laughs> <laughs> I think we turn this into like a much longer stream than it already is. So uh, I think now it would be as good of any time to get into our final thoughts. So as we said earlier, there are some pluses and minuses on both sides. Some things worked for us, some things didn't. Mm -hmm. And that's what, you know, these book clubs are about. That's what the panel is about. <laughs> you know, not everything is going to work for everybody. So mm -hmm. I want to get your final thoughts overall on the book. And I will start with Natasha. So for me, uh, this is not normally my genre or style that mm -hmm. I would hop into. Um, but I didn't hate it. Like, <laughs> I... I liked the mystery of it. That part mm -hmm. dragged me in. Um, there was a lot of brutality in there. I was not expecting. And that was a like, little off-putting for me just because anything with kids, I kind of mm -hmm. had a hard time with. Um, but the cat was funny <laughs> to me. It probably wasn't intended to be funny. But for yeah, me, are you really talking about like the main cat or the, like, yeah, the other? the main cat. Oh, Wait, because what? like the cat I keep focusing on is like the Wilford Brimley the informational cat. cat? Oh, oh, that was... <laughs> <laughs> no, no, the the, the, the funny cat. That's okay, you cat. can't tell me that you don't yeah. see it now. That's yeah. Um, <laughs> no, but for me, this the story it drew, it drew me in. It definitely it did feel like I was reading as if I was watching a movie kind of thing. It was very. Um, 
in depth. It was very, for you know, parts of it were hard for me to follow just because it was like so much detail that I got kind of lost a little bit. Like it was too much information, but the overall story was really good. You, I mean, you still are wondering like by the end of this, at least this book, um, you know, she gets off to a certain place and you're like, okay, what happens next? What's going on? Like what? I need more information, that kind of thing. And that's always a sign of a good story to me is when you want to know more. But um, overall, totally, usually not my my bag of chips, but I totally enjoyed it. And um, I'm actually going to pass this on to my daughter because I think she'd love it. Sweet. No, uh, which, well, I'm, I'm assuming you're older. The oldest one. Yeah. <laughs> the oldest one. Not. Just to be clear. Not the middle one. Not the two-year-old, not the nine-year-old, the 19-year-old. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That, that, is, that is more age-appropriate reading. Yes. Just to okay. be clear. <laughs> Just wanted to clarify. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Ashley, how about you? What was your uh, what are your final thoughts on the uh, on Monstrous? Yeah, my my takeaways, the high points for me are easily uh, the world building, they do an excellent job of piecing together a world that is so unlike our own, but immediately accessible. And uh, one thing I didn't get to mention earlier that I did want to point out is there is a map in the back of this, of the world and where everything is, which I found super helpful. I love any sort of like appendix. If you're going to, if you're going to go big like this, you kind of, <clears throat> excuse me, you kind of have to do that. So I love the commitment. And I think they do a really good job building the world. Uh, and the other thing that they're really successful at is really, really strong, powerful, unapologetic female uh, characters that are on a war path, whatever that means for them, and don't yield. And I think that's great. And I would love to see more characters like this in comics, in TVs, in movies, in prose books across the board. I think these kinds of characters are really powerful. And it's the kind of representation uh, that I would love to see more for women in story. Uh -huh. um, I did kind of like Natasha say struggled with some of the narrative later on you have to really commit to getting down into the nitty-gritty of of what they're saying here and of the world building and the dialogue because it is important but it's uh -huh. a little dialogue heavy in the back half of this yeah. but otherwise I was about it and I liked it and the same thing as Natasha fantasy doesn't tend to be the area I go I'm the sci-fi you know post-apocalyptic uh -huh. slice of life girly but this was awesome and it's so well executed that even if it's not your genre, you will find yourself enjoying it no matter what. I will, I will have to agree with both of you. Uh, and I like to offer like the male opinion from this. It was, it, it's also not my cup of tea. And I don't say, I don't say that at all because, you know, it's all probably, or probably predominantly women. Mm -hmm. But again, I did have a little bit of a hard time because of the, the heaviness in terms of like the, uh, the world building. But again, that's not always necessarily a bad thing. Like when I mm -hmm. read Lord of the Rings, yeah. it took me a lot of time to get into that. And Ashton, this, you know, did you encounter a similar problem with Dune? That is such a heavy book. Mm -hmm. I mean, did you have a hard time getting into that? Because that's very heavy in terms of its world building as well. Yeah. And it's the same thing. Like the first, the first several chapters of, of Dune are nothing but world building and explaining like who the characters are, what their motivations are, and what the drama is, basically, which is what this was. It, it did all of those same things. So imagine, you know, after this is accomplished, the setup that like the back half of Dune is all of the action and resolutions, the following issues of this would be actions and resolutions as well. So in for a penny, in for a pound. If you're going to read a book about world building, you got to realize that some of it is just figuring out where the hell you are and what's going on there. And I think one of you said earlier that uh, a general statement about women and how they tend to be more detail oriented. Was that mm -hmm. you, Ashton, I believe? Yes. And I think that also applies into this book. So I think, you know, as long as you're a little bit detail oriented and you pay mm -hmm. close attention to what's going on in the book, I honestly don't think that you'd have any kind of problem following along, mm -hmm. especially if you're into those like world building types of, yeah. you know, fantasy genres and whatnot. I mean, you can easily get yourself immersed in this. And I can say by the end of the book, and I'm not going to spoil it, but when that character shows up at the end, Natasha, I believe you know who we're talking about. It's like the last page, that last panel. Uh -huh. They kind of come back into the scene, and it does kind of like make you want to wonder, or makes you wonder what's going to happen from here. Yeah. Like, how are they coming back into the picture? It makes me mm -hmm. want to read more and figure out where is this story going from here. And I think that's yeah. what any good comic book should set out to do is to make mm -hmm. you want to read more. And I think yeah. for me at least this comic accomplished that. So yes, agreed. 
Uh, and I think that pretty much sums it up for Monstrous in terms of what we wanted to go over, story, art, final thoughts. Mm -hmm. um, let's get into suggested reading. So do you have any kind of suggested reading for people who might like a title like this or from any kind of like female, you know, women creator, artist, writer in general? Natasha, I'll start with you. Uh, I am going with the awesome Gail Simone. Um, nice. Good choice. Know right uh she's epic if you don't follow her on twitter it's like the best time of your life to follow her uh she's awesome she's so good at trolling people too it's amazing um she's awesome quit quit but beyond that if you don't know who she is she which is astonishing she's like one of the pivotal women in comics um she's written for birds of prey batgirl deadpool um secret six uh she created huntress and beyond that I wanted to spotlight her today, especially because she is had the longest run of the woman writer for Wonder Woman. And I think that's like yes. a really notable feat in comics in that, you know, it's Wonder Woman and it's written by a woman. And I think that's really powerful and awesome. And she's just fantastic. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to pick just one piece from her because there's so much good stuff out there. So if you don't know who she is, Google search mm -hmm. contact your local comic shop and say hey i would like any of her writings because you will not be disappointed excellent recommendation ashton let's go to you what kind of recommended reading can you uh give us yeah my my recommended reading based off of this is animosity by marguerite bennett uh marguerite bennett is incredible she writes a great story it's more post-apocalyptic and <laughs> and I mean, it's me. Why wouldn't it be? <laughs> it's I forget you can hear me off camera. <laughs> yeah, um, I have to fulfill my brand as reading only three types of books. <laughs> I'm okay with that. Sorry. But it's similar vibe in that like there's kind of these two warring factions between like the animals and the humans. And it does a, a really good job of sucking you in right away. And animals can talk, which is... Oh, that's fun. Learning in a different way. <laughs> I was I was actually going to suggest Marguerite Bennett and uh, Animosity as well because that first nice. trade paper, that first trade paperback is just oh. really good. Like it's just yeah. all of a sudden, Natasha. I'm assuming you haven't read it, have you? No, I'm apparently excellent, I need to. Excellent book. So, <laughs> apparently, it's like um just all of a sudden at like the same time, mm -hmm. just like all animals gain sentience and they're able to talk with the knowledge of what they've experienced up to that point. Oh, that's troublesome. And so it was like the family <laughs> dog, the family dog can like, says to a wife. Tell all your like, secrets. Yeah. Well, oh, the yeah. family dog says to a wife is like, I don't know why you put up with him because he's been beating you and stuff like that. It gets like dark, like super yeah. quick. Oh my like, God. And it's like, you know what? There's like a, a mother pig who like says to her pig, it's like, where are my babies? As they're being taken off to like the, the slaughterhouse and stuff like it's, mm -hmm. it sucks you in right away, but it's an excellent wow. read by, by a female creator and Marguerite Bennett, I agree, is, is, is Very great. twisted. So, <laughs> but as far as Monstrous goes, so if you're interested in reading Monstrous, be sure to look for it at your friendly local comic shop to find a comic shop near you. Simply head over to comicshoplocator.com. And let's give some people, give you guys a little chance to send out some plugs. So uh, let's start with Natasha. Like, where can people find you online? Um, super easy. Canon Doll X. Come on, my name's not there anymore. There it is. There we go. <laughs> I'm so just, good at this. Just search for that online. And uh, find it yeah, just whatever. Google it and you can find it. Uh, or you go to canondollx.com and it will also, it will link you. And on one easy page, it will show you my awesome show that airs every Wednesday called DST Unboxed. Um, on Fridays, it is here on previews. And um, I unbox awesome stuff from Dime Select Toys and Gentle Giant Studios. Everything from Star Wars to Marvel to uh, obviously uh, awesome movie franchises, everything. And then also just other c content that I make personally is also on there, uh, event coverage. All sorts of you know just fun nerdum and also maker stuff too i have some black stuff blacksmith stuff on there too i'm, I'm also jealous yeah. of you because in dst unbox you get to view all those Scott, scotty young animated statues before i, I do, do. Them. I do. <laughs> and every time i do i always mention how much johnny would probably love this <laughs> every single one yeah. Ashton, how about you where can people follow you online uh you can come hang out with me at free comic book day facebook twitter instagram tiktok 
Um, in particular, come hang out with me on Facebook. We're doing a March Madness bracket right now, pitting rival schools against each other to find the best one. And right now it's Riverdale High versus the Starfleet Academy. So go oh, vote. Boy. I know. Go vote. I know my vote. <laughs> pick one. Me too. Me too. <laughs> I think we should have thrown a couple actual like Starfleet. college schools in there just to like see like, you know, Professor <laughs> Xavier school it. built or beat out like, you know, wherever. Gonzaga or whatever, some actual <laughs> college sports team. I also like to point out free comic book day, one of the best holidays of the year. Yes. May 6th. Just saying. Coming up soon. Just saying. Yep. It is and May 6th yep. at your local comic More information, show. you can go to freecomicbookday.com. I got invited to a Mother's Day tea that day, Ooh. and I was like, what time is it? Because I have to go to the <laughs> comic book shop first. <laughs> you know your priorities. And we yeah, I was that. like, I got I to gotta get my free comics first. Then I'll go have some tea. <laughs> you can drink tea while, like, with your pinky That's out right. while, while you're like while you're reading, reading the comments. Hmm. There you go. <laughs> well, ladies, thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate you going over Monstrous from Image Comics mm -hmm. with me. And this is to oops, this to that. So this is to everyone out there who's watching. If you have a graphic novel that you'd like for us to talk about, leave a comment and we will try to pick yours for a future episode. And just as a reminder to like, follow, subscribe, do all the things. For at Previews World, at Free Comic Book Day. As Ashton said, May 6th is Free Comic Book Day. So look for your friendly local comic shop. See if they're participating. And if they're not, ask them what's wrong with them. Because they should be. Free Comic Book Day is awesome. But that is it for now. And like to say goodbyes. And I was, this is what Mia always says. And it's going to sound weird me saying it. But yeah, someone else has to say this. So heroes are a dime a dozen. But comic fans are priceless. We'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.